So Steve, could you please tell me what you think the role of creativity is in wellness? I believe creativity has tremendous potential to help people. We know this from the research in, in many different areas of wellness by, for example, writing has been proven in research to really make a difference. Just the act of writing in itself doesn't even matter what you write. It's the act of writing and getting this, what's inside out. It's, it's curative, it's healthy, and it's the most inexpensive way to uh, help people uh, in terms of wellness. And wh whether you're in a situation which I've, I've used writing with people who are in a, uh, a situation where they are uh, have PTSD or they're in, a, in a, a, a serious psychological uh, uh, diagnosis, and whether you use it every day with people like I've, I've taught people in their 80s, 70s and 80s. I had a group that went on for 10 years. Nobody dropped out. I feel that the, the, the very act of participating in that has tremendous uh, benefits for people that we're not using enough. There's just too much uh, tendency to go with drugs and go with, because it's easy, you write a prescription and uh, that's it's it's something we we really need to get into our society more and it it's truly part of the humanistic tradition to deal with the whole person and all of us uh, our creativity is a part of who we are and what we do and so much of it is accessible but we don't take the time to go there to deal with it so art writing, performance, anything that is enjoyable for people can also help them learn more about themselves as they express themselves and feel better about themselves. How is it that you think that art is able to create such a healing? Well, I think it's a very uh, holistic uh, process where you have things going on that you haven't dealt with, and either you don't have the time or you haven't actually, uh, you're avoiding them to some extent. So, so in some cases it can be cathartic that you, that you talk about things that you haven't really been able to express. And it doesn't have to be conscious. As we know, there's a lot of ways you can do this. And for example, you can do a, a painting, and I've had this experience, I'm not an artist, but you do a painting and, and uh, you don't think about what it means and then you step back from it and you say, oh, I see this might relate to uh, a problem I'm dealing with or something in my history. So there's, it's, it's information that comes through in a, in a very natural way and uh, it, it can be difficult at times, but most of the time it's going to be it's going to be worth whatever the struggle is to get get to a place where you have a better understanding of yourself and what you're dealing with in terms of uh, what's getting in the way of wellness. Somehow it seems like art is transcendent in a way, like we're able to touch on something that isn't available to us in our sort of ordinary mind or ordinary daily life. Could you talk? To that a bit? I, yeah, that's that's a great point because I felt that even when I when I, I used to write uh, television for many years, and there were times when things would happen where I would see see them produced where I said I didn't I didn't even realize it meant that. And when you're working, when you're really cooking, when you're really really operating at maximum level, you have access to information that isn't necessarily conscious. And so the process is, it's, uh, it's tremendously joyful when it's working. Uh, it's also to engage in material, to gauge in this process 
it, it really requires you to be present. You can't fake it. If you're faking it, nothing happens. So it's very uh, much a, a, a personal participation that happens when you're doing this. And that raises the level of your game. When you're, when you're really there and when you're really thinking about things and participating and engaged, that you're not worried about all the things that keep you up at night or all of the beating up of yourself or all the, all the difficulties that we all face in life. You know, this is, uh, no, life is uh, not easy, but there are ways that we can engage in it that make it uh, exciting and interesting and uh, hopefully in the long run, maybe not less painful, but pain that's understood. So you think that art helps us understand our pain? Absolutely. Yes, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a process that when you, when you go and see a, a great play, when you see Cat on a tin, Hot Tin Roof, or you see Death of a Salesman, you see these great works of art, and that's true for any, any medium, a painting too, or a great painting, you transcend into another uh, area. I've, I've written about something called audience flow, which is that it, watching is not necessarily passive. That you, if you are engaged and you're thinking, you can experience changes in your behavior and your understanding through uh, a vicarious, so-called vicarious experience because you are part of the process. The, the artist intended to communicate to you, to everyone. And so it's a, it's a shared process. I think that's underestimated in terms of its power and its ability to really uh, move people and change people. And everybody who's watching this has experienced this and knows what I'm talking about. They may not have act actually you know, done it actively, but it's available. And it's so personal, it seems, because every time I see a Van Gogh painting, like, I don't know, something happens in me. I'm just so moved by him or some kind of connection. I, I don't even know how yeah. to put words to it. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a number of artists for me like that. Van Gogh, of course, is one of them. When I was in the Van Gogh Museum, it was like almost overwhelming. I couldn't, it was the energy and the, and the, the color and the brilliance and it was transcendent. It was almost a, a religious experience right. to be in that kind of great art or if you've been in the Rothko Chapel in, in uh, I think it's in Texas and, and uh, you go in there and at first I go in and well this is all black. I don't know. This is, I, I don't know about Rothko. I, and after a while, I'm sitting there and it, it starts, I start to see things in the black. And the more you sit there, the more you see, oh my gosh, he was really building an environment here. He was really saying something. And it was, uh, again, a transcendent kind of feeling, a spiritual feeling, you know. There's a sense of intimacy somehow. You're like connected with something in this other person that you don't even know or it stirs yeah, something. That's very well said. Yes, there is. The, a real artist is giving you a part of themselves and, and often a part, they're trusting, they're trusting you with that. And uh, they want to tell you something. They want to say something. They want to understand it themselves. So that, you know, the, the Rollo May, who was connected to Saybrook, was a part of Saybrook University, he, he talked about, he wrote a book called The Courage to Create, which is just an incredible book, uh, based on uh, the idea of Paul Tillich's The Courage to Be, that you really, to be an artist is to really put yourself out there, to really take risk and, and, and trust that you're not always going to succeed. You're not going to... Most people who have done this have never been really satisfied with what they've done. They go, well, this is good, but I could have done it better. I could have done this. So to have the trust to put that out there to people and have them, you know, 
give give it back whatever you get. Sometimes it's not what you want. Sometimes you you fail, and that's why why I think artists are the bravest people in the world in many ways. Uh, I, we're not going to argue whether they're more courageous than people to go on a battlefield or not, but they they are. They are willing to give of themselves to the world in order to, to, to communicate and to make things better. And that is the, and it makes them better. This idea that mental illness is connected to, to that you need to be mentally ill in order to be an artist, which is a falsehood that's been around for a long, long time. And many people still believe that. that uh, Having a mental illness gives you an edge, or being an alcoholic, or we know enough about this now to know that it isn't uh, an edge, and you don't need it, and it might give you a different perspective. But when you when you work, you are healthier. When you Virginia Woolf, for example, uh, is often held up an example. Well, she said her writing was what kept her going. If she hadn't been a writer, she probably wouldn't have been able to live nearly as long as she did. So there are clear examples where the writing, I can't think of anything, there probably is, because the wonderful thing about human life and creativity is endless varieties, but where the writing has made you sicker, where it's done you any harm or you got artists, maybe, well, Van Gogh, they said the pigment, if he's eating the paint, if that was true. That made him so, well, but it wasn't the painting. It wasn't the participation in the game. That's, that is uh, really something that I feel very strongly about. There was a, a, an APA meeting about public for the public good, and uh, I, I stood up at that meeting in the end and said, you know, we have the greatest resource here and we're not using it. There are so, there's so, it's like the last resort or it's over here on the side and it needs to be in the absolute center of treatment because it's cost effective and, it, and it's uh, non-damaging, there's no side effects. You know, you watch these TV shows, the side effects, you know, uh, are <laughs> terrible, right? So, including death, nobody ever died from doing art. How do you think that art can be utilized in helping people who are struggling with problems in living? Well, I, I think, you know, it depends. It's it's not, there's no one size fits all in humanistic psychology. Each person and each case is different. Uh, but I think if, if somebody is struggling and they're able, and it's very important not to force someone into doing something or try to make them feel that if they don't do it, they are failing in some way, but to get them to open up even a little bit at a time, depending on where they are, they are is a, uh, a tremendous gift and in order to do this you need interpersonal skills you really need to to understand what you're doing and, and how you're doing it and when you when you give people the opportunity to be heard when you interact with them and you're listening it's a it's a form of therapy that's why it is called art therapy uh, so it's, it's a way of uh, getting people to open up, to express themselves, to trust someone else, to trust themselves. It sounds like when you talk about mindfulness, when you talk about the value of art in um, working with people who are suffering or have some sort of um, mental hurt situations. It sounds like you're talking about helping them, number one, come back to the present moment and sort of be in the flow of their own being through art. It sounds a little bit like art can promote a sense of mindfulness. Yes, I, 
to me there is an existential element to to art because it requires you to be present uh, you, you if you're faking it you know, you're not you're not going to end up with anything and it's going to be obvious obvious to you but you're allowed to try and there is to me there's no failure if you try and you you know it doesn't work it's a process so you get the process going so it's like write three words and then just keep writing do one brush stroke do a few brush strokes don't worry about it it's an abstract just just do whatever you feel and there's no failure there has to be a sense of safety and security uh, when you're dealing with uh, fragile people you need to be careful and your first responsibility is to you know not make things any worse do no harm and so it's not uh, it's not just hand them some paper and walk away it's be their support there and you don't really want well, my experience with this and I'm I think most people have done it you don't really have to do that much you give them the material and all of us uh, have that instinct to do this even if you're not uh, I was one of those people that was told don't ever go near a art brush again or I'll kill you you know that kind of I had that experience and so uh, for me when I got into this and I was doing some of this it was like oh no I can't you know I'm gonna draw these terrible stick figures but after a while I became less self-conscious or I worked in collage where I felt safe where I wasn't didn't have to draw and uh, I think everybody has that that uh, joy in art in them almost everybody I mean it's it's very hard when you're dealing with extreme depression you you have to really just hope to get one little thing you know you, you can't force people to do this uh, it's something they have to want to do and and the more they do it the more they'll want to do it and uh, it's just they're so grateful to be heard because when you're in pain you it, it's very difficult to communicate what you're feeling so art can do that it can give you a new um, vehicle through which to express yourself that maybe right. you can't access with words. Right, exactly, exactly. And that you can't even access with your consciousness. You know, so you get this, you get the, the value of dreams in a way are an art form in the sense that you're constructing scenarios based on your experience and your desires and your wish. So that's... A, it's another form of, of expression, and all of these things are really uh, under uh, underrated in our society. And uh, I think we can we can correct this uh, pretty easily, but it requires uh, a real understanding. And that the reason I. I came to cost effective is that's what the decision makers understand and so if we can talk to the decision makers say you'll save money with this but again I mean there's all kinds of uh, there's no art lobby there's drug lobby so you know you, you, it's not always uh, an objective uh, game so it's a skewed game we're in uh, but it's worth it's worth Fighting. It's worth going for this for people because when it works, it's so beautiful to see someone how proud they can be and how relieved they can be. It is a form of catharsis when you find of a therapy. You know how first time when I went to therapy, it was like I told some things that were I'd never talked to anybody about, and they were. They were pretty bad in my own mind. When I came out of there, I felt great. I'm like, how did that work? How did that happen? And uh, I think it's the same process. You know, you, you kept this inside and it comes out and it's not, 
even if it's bad, and often it is, it's, it's very bad. I'm not, not saying it, it diminishes, it relieves. It's always going to be better to get it out than to keep it in because when it's in, it just goes around in circles and you're, you're stuck with it. So you say art or the creative process has a way of allowing us to get some of this stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's an expression for everybody who does it. Whether you're doing it in a, a wellness you're doing it in a in a therapeutic standing, or you just want to you just want to write. I mean, when I wanted to become a writer, I didn't realize I had things I really wanted to get out and say. That that came along, but uh, the, there are it's definitely an expression and a need to to communicate to, to end isolation to some degree. So creativity can be a connecting piece for people. And it is. That's creativity. how we do connect. You know? I think it is. What are your it's hopes? Not the only way, but it's certainly an important way. What are your hopes for the future of creativity in mental health arts? Yeah, my my hope is that more people are are trained in uh, creativity studies and expressive arts, not just expressive arts. That, that, that what, what I've found in, in teaching creativity studies is that people, by understanding more about the uh, underpinnings of, and, the, and what we know about it, and there's still a lot we need to learn to know, but we do know quite a bit about aspects of it. The more they understand it and can personally experience it, the more uh, able they will be to communicate uh, to people they're working with, and the more they'll be able to grow themselves. So it's a matter of personal growth as well as professional growth, and that's that's always been my interest. Not just to teach, but to, to have real growth as part of the process. So do you see arts, painting, music, dance, being used more fully for its healing potential in the future in helping people heal from all sorts of things? Yeah, I, I honestly believe that what, what has been going on uh, in the United States, but it's not just here because I've talked to people from all over the world, uh, is this teach to the test mentality, which most people we talk to say, yeah, it's terrible. Okay, it's terrible, but that was educational policy in the United States under a number of the last two presidents, Bush and Obama, and uh, what, guess what's happening? The test, they've, they've eliminated a lot of arts programs around the country and the test scores are going down. I just finished a video called Creativity in the Classroom, uh, which APA uh, sponsored. and, and the whole idea here is teachers aren't trained uh, to understand anything about creativity. They are uh, uh, go through their uh, schools of education and uh, they barely get any psychology now. There's just too many things you have to do so that the, the whole thing is, is like lockstep. To, to n not to grow, but to answer the questions. Now, we know the world's changed. We know that doesn't work. So why are we still doing it? Things that can drive you nuts, absolutely nuts. So the additional factor is that it is healing for some of these students who are having trouble at home, dealing with things, or they aren't able to cope. Having a chance to do these, these arts when they're young will do the same thing, will we'll help them heal without them ever being aware of it. They won't even uh, think about it. But so it, it's, it, helps, it helps make the tests better. Why does it do that? Because the experience of working in the arts, of, of thinking differently and trying different things out, the, those are things that translate into other aspects of life. And 
it's uh, it's a matter of just common sense to stop this crazy idea of putting our our young people in a situation like their parents of answer respond answer respond and and uh, hopefully hopefully ten years from now that will be changed at least to some degree it's very very hard to change a bureaucracy they want measurable results I understand I understand why they've done it uh, but it's a mistake and it's not working and and it's also not healthy not healthy for teachers either by the way who are under pressure and and don't aren't having fun in their jobs because they're always like they've got to make a certain level of get their students hit a certain number so there's a lot of uh, a lot of work to be done a lot of things that need to be done so what's your final hope in the name of creativity and healing well my my hope is that the, the power of and the joy of participating in creativity will will be given to more and more people and that we unleash the kind of idea of this kid that I keep in my mind of this kid and who's from a poverty situation who gets uh, a chance and through creativity builds a life that they have the potential to, to achieve so I see it as an equal opportunity I see it as a waste if we don't uh, if we don't help encourage some people who have extreme talent if we lose out we don't know who's going to have the answer to certain problems that we have now that are very extreme so this is from a this is from a not from a just an idealistic it's from a practical sense that we have so many resources and everybody in the world has a contribution to make and we don't know who can make these special contributions and so it just from an investment standpoint for everyone not just for that person but for all of us we need to be inclusive and we need to uh, allow creativity to be uh, a part of education a part of life so that's my hope that it expands the understanding expands we include it in every aspect of life and people use it to grow it's not like it's something that you just do once that it becomes an integral part of every part of, of your life how you make decisions how you make uh, uh, personal decisions how you make political decisions how you live your life and that you, you are more cognizant of creativity is at the core of psychology because to me psychology is about increasing choice increasing opportunities people come to psychologists when they're stuck they, they only see this choice or that choice and neither one of them are good or I mean they only see one choice creativity allows you to envision different things different ways of living different uh, personal choices different professional choices it's creating new lives it's making it's the very very heart of what psychology is and it and, and it eventually will be recognized and that's my hope that doesn't take another hundred years to get it into the main part of the conversation not off to the side right in the center thank you steve you're welcome